as I cast my mind back, I've got a vivid memory of you in a Gary Rogers car at Queensland Raceway, Queensland 500, right at the very start of your career. And now we're on the edge of the end of your full-time career. Give me a summary of the journey. What's it been like? Whew, a summary, a quick summary? or Quick summary, a quick, if you like. Quick summary. The dominant man of V8 supercar racing. He is on the cusp of greatness. We are the champions, mate. You are the champions. Yeah. 100 supercar victories. It's been a hell of a ride. Yeah, it, it, was, a, it was a hell of a ride. Do you recall the first laps in a supercar? And what was it like? Yeah, I do, I do. Was it Malala in a, in a it was an EL a Falcon. It was, it was fast. I just remember the, the sheer horsepower. The biggest thing that I noticed was the, the, the windscreen. I'd driven go-karts my whole life, and then to get in a car behind a windscreen with no um, airflow, that was a real strange environment. In this, in this heated sweat box sauna, doing your thing um, was, uh, was quite unique. I hope it's a new beginning for me, and uh, I'll keep pushing all year. Did you ever envisage to become what they're now describing as the GOAT, you know, as the greatest of all time? <laughs> No, you never, you never think then, you know, what, what the future holds. But at the same time, I've always had a lot of self-belief, and I've always, I've always believed in myself that if I, uh, if I dedicated the time to a particular activity, I could, I could do it well. I cringe a little bit when I watch my early interviews. Yeah, thanks, Rusty. What a fantastic ever. first time on the podium. It's great to be, do it here at Sandown on the home territory. Do you recall your very first conversation with Roland Dane? I do, yeah. He, he rang me to um, ask if I had any plans for what was 2006. He was quite, he was quite hard to talk to, RD. It was, it was, there was no joking around, there was no um, any chat off the agenda. It was, I need the facts, I need them as quick as possible. <laughs> Let's do a deal. And, and the, the deal with Triple Eight was done before I got back to the airport. So he spoke to the engineers while I was driving to the airport and, and I was sitting in the lounge waiting for my plane home and got, a, got the offer and accepted it and off we went. We know how awesome he is. Probably a fair risk because they, as a team, were not the powerhouse that we now know Triple Eight Race Engineering to be. So what drove you to make that decision? It was, uh, it's, it's probably just instinct. You know, if you look at the raw results and numbers, I, f I followed those cars, I saw what they did. I saw the way that they come from, from here to here and so fast. I knew they were gonna be a, a force to be reckoned with for, for a long time. Win Cup wins for the first time! And Lowndes, one of the first to congratulate him. I'm going to talk about our old mate, Craig Lowndes. Oh, yeah. Tell me about when you first met Lowndesy. <laughs> Gee, when did I first meet Lowndesy? Um, it was almost... It was almost when we were teammates. Yeah, when, uh, when at the end of 2005, coming to Queensland, he just helped me out wherever he could. Um, always played a straight bat, and um, yeah, we worked together. Chalk and cheese, you two blokes. But yeah. the odd couple kind of worked. It did, yeah. As you say, his strengths are completely opposite. His strengths are my weaknesses, and hopefully my weaknesses are his strengths, you know? So two of the same personalities in the same team wouldn't, wouldn't anywhere near have been as beneficial as, um, as the two personalities together. And here are just some of many, many tributes around the track. You remember being in the eye of the storm at Bathurst in 2006? Yeah, I, I remember it. I remember it clearly. It was a, it was an eerie day, and I've never heard a, a one, a, an actual one-minute silence. That's one-minute silence. I think even the birds went quiet for for a minute. You know, we had Bev Brock in the garage. We had Lounsey in tears. It was a, it was an emotional day, and then there was just this sense of it was it was ours. It was ours to win. Fantastic job, mate. Unbelievable. And then that un. A pretty special period for you guys, didn't it? You know, the three peat. We went through a heavy duty triple eight phase. Yeah, we, we had a, a real performance advantage on most of the other cars at the time. But remember, we developed our own rim, front upright, rear um, axle assembly. Everything was pretty much custom, you know, and we were there was so much, uh, so much scope in the rules to be able to develop. You arrived with this bloke who had a giant reputation and then you chipped away at it and you ultimately overcame him, didn't you? 
Well, I did 12 months the, the, the loungy way, just to, to feel my way, but from 07 onwards, um, I started to get some, some real trust with the engineering group. Um, and also the mechanics and the rest of the team to go, oh, can, we, can we try over here a bit? Because this is more, more my style. And um, we started to find some fruit going in that direction. And change change. For the lead. Jamie Wincup in control now. Oh, Nick! Wincup has made a massive mistake. There's also a bit of a Bathurst demon for you, isn't there? <laughs> That's over and out for car Triple A. It's been one of those joints where it's kind of, you know, it's pay and pay back. We did three in a row right at the start of my career, you know, so I, I almost after that, I was like, any more than this, I'm, I'm just being greedy. 2014 was a unique one. It's gonna lose the lead of this motor race on these numbers. Two and a half laps to go, we hit the reserve team. There was an intense situation back in the pits on, are you gonna make it on fuel or not? So we'll just have to see what happens, mate, but we're probably gonna run out. That, that, I've had that 30 or 40 times before that race, you know. Of course, it's an intent. Save as much fuel as you can. Why is Wind Cup continuing to hold that margin? And Most have goes through on the inside. We all, we all died inside. Ran out of fuel with exactly half a lap to go, and um, somehow we rolled down the hill and still finished fifth. For me, it, was, it just wasn't our race to win. Wow. Pretty proud of you boys though, thanks fellas. That changed my perspective on performance after that. You just um, judged your performance on what result you got, but that's what, when you're 80 years old and on your deathbed, that's that's what you're gonna remember, it's, it's the effort. Awesome job all weekend. I was, I was quite happy with the with the performance we done. I threw my boots and gloves into the crowd and what I didn't know at the time was that was just infuriating RD even more and um, he, he let me have it when I got back to the pits. What did he say? He basically said, mate, you lost us the race, you know, which, which hurts, which hurts for, for a teammate to say that you've underperformed and you single-handedly lost, lost the race for us. Um, that was pretty painful at the time, but he may have been right, but I don't think so. <laughs> They're hanging on a safety car. 2016, this, that was a wild one, wasn't it? The three of you blokes blazing through the paddock. Tell me about it. Nice big slipstream down Conrad Strait, pulled out of the chase, it was on, I knew it was on, Scotty knew it was on, everyone knew that the pass was coming. The, the stewards thought that I was out of control, but I, I wasn't out of control, you just I had plenty of brake on at the end and I, I, I knew there was going to be contact because Scotty, was, he just took the, the normal racing line. There's a debate whether it was enough to, for Scotty to leave the track. As soon as the contact happened, Scotty just decided to arrow it straight across the grass. So I decided to do the, the rear dress rule. Garth thought this was his opportunity to grab both of us, and those two ended up running into each other. It had nothing to do with me. But the stewards didn't see it that way. They thought it was my fault for the whole incident. Not, not many people have crossed the line first and not won the great race. There's been a couple of interesting clashes over the years. There was a ripper in 2014 in Tasmania between you and CL. And uh, legend has it that Roland marched you blokes into the truck and gave <laughs> you a fair bollocking. There's only really one rule, and that's don't run into each other. He, he didn't care what everyone's story was. He said, mate, I, I'm relying on you guys not to run into each other, and you ran into each other. So if, if it happened again, we'd be packing our bags, no doubt. What about in 2016, uh, there was a bit of aggravation in New Zealand, wasn't there a bit of teammate rubbing? I locked the rears, touch, we both pirouetted around it. Looked quite elegant on the TV. Has SVG ever bitten back? Like, has he ever leapt into the truck in debrief or jumped out of the car and given you a spray? No, he hasn't. Never seen him really fire. He doesn't fire up. Um, no, I've never seen him actually had a, had a had a go at someone. I don't reckon he's I don't reckon he's hit anyone in his life. He's not that he's not he's not that aggressive person off track. There's a couple of really memorable moments for me in your life that I think are particularly special. I'm interested in your comments on this, but I thought it was a superhuman effort in 2012 in Adelaide with you and Davo, the backdrop of what had happened to your, your dad. Um, that, that was, um, you know, at, at a personal and a professional level, profound. Biggest loss of my life because dad was dad was dad, but he was also my best mate at the same time. And uh, but I think he'd be proud. But um, I'm hoping to um, I'm hoping to you know be that be be that fatherly figure to to the next generation. Have you allowed yourself to stop and think what life's going to look, feel, and taste like 
when you get to whatever the last lap may be at Mount Panorama? No, no, I have, I haven't. I've got, um, I've got plenty of, plenty of motor, plenty of motivation for next year. I've got, uh, I'm jumping in the, jumping in the big seat with the, with the managing director's role at Triple Eight. So that's going to be a huge challenge. It's probably, it's going to be one of the biggest challenges of my life. The, the, the pressure of, you know, the 20 minutes before qualifying, knowing you've got to throw the thing on the line and just try to milk every hundredth of a second out of the car, that's not going to be there. I reckon by March or April next year, I'll be, I'll be starved of, of that pressure. Um, as Novak Djokovic says, you know, pressure's a privilege, you know, and, and it's something I'm, every time I'm in that pressure situation, I'm, I'm thankful for it. It's going to be different, but um, I think I'll manage. What do you think you'll miss the most? Probably the competition. Yeah, the, I've, I've never got over the, just the, the, the battle, the on-track battle. You're sitting there in fifth position and somehow you've got to negotiate your way to try to get to the front, you know. Whether that's a good start, whether that's pit stop strategy, whether that's a passing move, a, a lunge, it doesn't matter. You're, you're, it's this, this game of trying to get to the front of the pack, you know, and that's, that's still as alive as it was day one, you know. That, that, I, I'll go out there on the weekend, I'll go out there at Bathurst and there's still that game that goes on which never ever gets old. So by far that'll be the um, that'll be what I'll miss. Can you nominate a defining edge? What do you think has separated you from the crowd? Oh, that's a hard one. I don't I don't rate myself. I certainly analyse my performance. What's blowing me away is even now, like 17 years or something I've been doing this, I'm still learning new things. I've still I'm still forced to evolve, still forced to do something different than what I've done the last 10 years to be, to stay relevant and stay competitive. And that's what's, that's what's kept it fresh the whole way. I had new, new teammates, new young guys in the sport doing things differently. And I've got this proven way that, that's worked for 10 years, but I've had to change, I've had to adapt and, uh, and, and had to stay relevant, which has been a, which, which has been a great challenge and I'm, I'm very grateful for it. It is life in a goldfish bowl and it's not widely understood outside the industry that it is a 24-7 pressure and it's unending and everyone forgets the last result pretty quickly and they're hungry to see what happens with the next result. It's a grind and, it, and if, you, if you don't love the grind then you're, you're not going to last long, you know. You might be able to string four or five years together but to keep doing it for 15, 17, 20 years, it's a, it's a long consistent grind. Those one percenters day in, day out, just stay on the straight and narrow the whole time, you know. So, yeah, not having to be absolutely 100% come uh, early March next year uh, and be absolutely up at a certain time, had the right breakfast, done the right mental preparation, ready to go for qualifying, that's going to be a luxury, you know. Um, at the same time, as I said, pressure's a privilege, you know, so I can't go full cold turkey on that because that's been happening since I was seven years old. You're in your late 30s, but when you look at a lot of drivers, they've been able to push their career into their early 40s and probably surprised a few people that you did drop the hammer when you did. How much consideration went into that before you made that decision? Was it was it an easy decision to make? There, there, there are plenty of factors and it wasn't an easy decision. It's, it's a massive, massive life-changing call to make. But as I keep saying, with I don't know if anyone, everyone, anyone's believing me or not, but it's, I just don't want to hold up a seat for, for a young up and comer, you know. I've had a fantastic career. The sport owes me nothing and I owe it everything. And yeah, I don't want to just keep hanging on. I've, I've got no doubt I can be, still be competitive for another three or four years, but what's the point of hanging on when someone can get this massive opportunity, grab it with two hands and, and off they go, which is exactly what we're hoping to do with, um, with Brock next year. Will you take snippets that you've picked up, things, traits, and understanding, and now apply them as a team owner? Are these things that you can apply that you go, actually, you know what? That recipe works. I might use a bit of that. 100%. You know, those, those things that, that were done 100 years ago that still work today, I, I think they're still gonna work in 100 years, you know. Obviously the world's changing a lot and there's, there's a new way, new way to do things. So you, you can't be old school, but you certainly gotta take some of those traits. When you discussed retirement with friends and family, how involved was Roland in that process? Or was he intrinsic? Was he right in the center of that universe? Oh, I, I, he was very close to the circle for sure. It was, the whole decision was driven by me. 
um, and it was, it was it was my decision. But he he would have been as close to that decision as, as anybody else. Um, he was in the same situation as me, looking for a new challenge. So we just kept kept communicating, and then found a um, found a happy medium when it was time for RD to move on and for me to um, to jump into his seat. Sometimes little things make big differences. That can change the team dynamic. It can change uh, how valuable that team can be from a sponsor investment standpoint. It can change the way you grab trophies. I mean, sometimes little things make big differences. I think I was the same as um, every employee at AAA. Like, what, what's the future hold? You know, we've, we've had this um, instrumental leader that we had so much trust in. We knew we were going to earn a living out of Eight for a long time to come and we we're going to keep uh, doing what we love doing and that's and that's race cars for a living. So um, that that figure is is now moving on. That's 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 where the that's where the pressure's on my shoulders, you know, to, to earn that respect um, and to, to show the same dedication, if not more than what he than what RD showed to to um, ensure the people at Triple Eight that we're still going to be going racing, we're still going to be at the front of the pack, and uh, we're going to be doing good things for a long time to come. As I said, I'm going to grab those those core things that um, that that RD and all the all the great leaders have done for the last hundred years, and try to try to do those well first and foremost. Um, but then I want to obviously want to do it do it my way as well and put my own uh, mix on it. Talk to me about the Triple Eight pillars. You know, work hard, all the usual things, excellence. Party hard's one of them, though, as well, isn't it? You have to celebrate a win, don't you? Like, what, what are you doing it for if you don't celebrate it? Losing David Couchy, that would be hard, I imagine, from a team standpoint, because he's made a very big contribution. And in your own words, then, he's also a close friend. So does that feel like a betrayal, or does he go with your blessing? No, he certainly goes with our blessing. Um, it's, a, it's a real tough scenario when you've got 10 or 15 core people that have all grown together uh, over you know 10 or 15 years. The only thing I ask of him is to um, respect his, his six months, respect the, the deal that we've done and wish him all the best in his new venture. But you look forward to beating him? Oh, 100%, yeah. We, we, we absolutely re, um, expect him to be throwing everything at, back at us and uh, we're gonna go out there and battle hard on the track for sure. And every race driver wants to jettison something out of their race driving repertoire when they get to the end. What's the thing that you're gonna, you know, least of all miss that you go, oh, happy days, I'm out of this now. <laughs> there's, there's, I suppose it's probably not one particular thing, but you know, doing doing any gig for 17 years, um, things things become repetitive, you know. And once it repeats too many times, you need to you need to have a reset, you need to get a new challenge, and off you go. So even if you're even if you're crook, you've still got to rock up and. Um, touch wood, I hope it continues, but I've been able to successfully compete in every single race I've, um, I've, I've been, um, been signed up for. So the rest of the, the week to week is generally somewhat compromised because of this fact that you have to show up every week and you can't put it off a week, you can't delay it. The right, round one is this date, it's happening at this time, whether you like it or not, so you, you rock up. That same thing I'm very grateful for with motorsport because that's it gives you massive discipline, which I've been able to put in um, all, all certain uh, other aspects of my life, which has been a, it's been a real positive.